Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to gather with all of you here in Gaston Hall for our latest event in our Faith and Culture series, a conversation today with celebrated author and human rights activist, Sister Helen Prejean. Sister Helen, we're grateful to you for your presence here, for sharing your reflections with us. It's a privilege to welcome you back here to the Hilltop. I wanna thank as well, Paul Eli, a senior fellow at our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs for curating this series and for moderating today's conversation. I'd also um, like to offer a special welcome to Sherilyn Branch, president of the GU 272 Descendants Association, who will join Sister Helen and Paul on stage a little later on in our conversation today. In addition to her leadership in the New, or in the New Orleans educational community, Sherilyn is a longtime friend of Sister Helen's. Very glad she could be a part of today's conversation. I'd like to extend my appreciation to our partners for today's event. The Pontifical Council for Culture, our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, our Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, and our Prisons Injustice Initiative. Joining us today, I'd like to acknowledge Bishop Paul Tai, Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture. Your Excellency, we remain deeply grateful for your leadership in advancing conversations on the topic of faith and culture and for your partnership in hosting events like this one here on our campus. We're, we're grateful that you're here with us today. I'd also like to thank Sean Casey, the director of our Berkeley Center, and Michael Kessler, the center's managing director. John Carr, founder and director of our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life, who we'll hear from in just a moment. And Mark Howard, the founding director of our prison, Prisons Injustice Initiative. For over a decade, our Faith and Culture series has brought extraordinary artists, writers, filmmakers to campus, individuals whose work explores the interaction of religion, art, literature, and society, engaging them in conversations that deepen our understanding of both faith and culture. This afternoon, we're honored to have the opportunity to welcome Sister Helen Prejean as a part of this series. Sister Helen is known throughout the world for her work to engage our national and international communities in an urgent conversation about the reality of capital punishment. For more than 30 years, she has devoted herself to a prison ministry working with inmates on death row, as well as the families of murder victims, serving as a vital voice on behalf of those impacted by the criminal justice system. Her advocacy has had global impact just last year, Sister Helen met with His Holiness Pope Francis, who has recently issued an update to the Catholic Catechism that opposes the death penalty without exception. Sister Helen became known around the country with the release and later film adaptation of her first book, Dead Man Walking, an eyewitness account of the death penalty in the United States, which uh, chronicled her experiences serving as a spiritual advisor to Patrick Sonaye, a convicted murderer on death row. In the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who wrote the preface for the book's re-release on its 20th anniversary, and I quote, as Sister Helen undergoes her transformation, so do we, close quote. She has continued to invite us on a journey of transformation as we engage in this important national conversation in 2004, she released a second book, The Death of Innocence, an eyewitness account of wrongful executions. And this summer, she published River of Fire, My Spiritual Journey, a book she has described as her spiritual autobiography. River of Fire follows Sister Helen's journey before the events of Dead Man Walking, beginning with her experiences as a young woman joining the congregation of St. Joseph in 1957, a journey that unfolded alongside changes in the Catholic Church following the Second Vatican Council. Once again, Sister Helen shares the story of her own transformation and in doing so, invites us to reflect on our own. We're honored to have Sister Helen with us today and to join her in conversation. We're glad to have as our moderator, Paul Eli. Paul is the author of The Life You Save May Be Your Own, a portrait of four 20th century Catholic writers, which won the Penn Martha Albrand Award for first nonfiction. 
also wrote Reinventing Bach. He was also responsible for the afterword for 13 Ways of Looking at the Death Penalty by Sister Helen's close friend and fellow advocate, Mario Marazzitti. Prior to his time at Georgetown, Paul worked in book publishing for many years as a senior editor with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Through his writings, his projects at the Berkeley Center, his leadership of the Faith and Culture series, Paul shares his remarkable spirit of inquiry and exploration with us as we examine the place of faith in contemporary society. So Paul and Sister Helen, I wanna thank you for leading us in today's conversation. And before they come on stage, I'd like to first invite John Carr of our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life to come to the podium and share a few reflections. John. Thank you, Jack, for those gracious words and for your welcoming, principled, and faithful leadership here at Georgetown. Our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life is pleased to co-sponsor this conversation with Sister Helen Prejean and Paul Eli, and I'm honored to say a few words about Sister Helen's leadership. In my first class this fall, I told my students that the Catholic social tradition is shaped both by moral principles and extraordinary people. I invi invited them to come tonight to hear one of those people. Sister Helen Prejean is a preeminent example of faith in action, Catholic social teaching and work, and one of the most compelling leaders of our church and nation. Last Wednesday night, during an intense discussion that filled this hall on global migration, a leader who works on the border asked, where can we find hope? Tonight is about hope. At a time when our church is in crisis and our country in disarray, one sign of hope is that our nation is turning away from the death penalty. 20 states and counting do not permit it. Executions have been cut in half in a decade. Increasingly, prosecutors don't ask for it and juries don't choose it. As Sister will tell us, we have much more work to do. The Trump administration is seeking to reinstate federal execution. But thanks to Sister Helen and many others, we understand that capital punishment threatens the lives of innocent people who lack resources to defend themselves, that race and class contribute to who lives and who dies, and that we cannot teach that killing is wrong by killing those who kill others. In the Catholic community, I believe two people contributed most to this shift. Pope, now St. John Paul II, who visited and forgave the man who tried to kill him and came to our country to appeal for an end to the death penalty. Sister Helen has made the case in every state in the nation that the death penalty diminishes all of us and violates human decency and a Catholic commitment to human life. Sister Helen wrote John Paul II on the death penalty, and some suggest Sister Helen's witness and words contributed to his leadership, and ultimately Pope Francis' action to revise the catechism, an unusual act in Catholic life, to declare the death penalty an attack on human dignity and call the church to work for its abolition. Some credit Sister Helen for this change, I am convinced it was the Holy Spirit, but Sister Helen helped the Spirit along. Many know Sister Helen from her book and the film Dead Man Walking, as Jack said. In River of Fire, you write about your superior's sometime harsh efforts to keep you humble. I don't know how you can be humble when Susan Sarandon won an Academy Award for portraying your life. This is a unique spiritual challenge. I asked my family who might portray me in a movie, <laughs> and my son suggested Danny DeVito. <laughs> Sister Ellen has impacted my family in other ways. After hearing her, my daughter Kelly started corresponding with a young man in Florida on death row, which is every father's dream. In 
in my work with the Bishop's Con Conference, I would receive occasional calls from Sister Helen with some mixed feelings. My first thought, this is gonna be fun. And my second thought is I'm gonna have a lot of work to do when this call is over. It is not easy saying no to a nun, especially if that nun is Sister Helen. That's why a number of us here work together with Sister Helen to form the Catholic Mobilizing Network and we celebrate our 10th anniversary and our progress on October 10th at the Papal Nunciature. Sister Helen is a woman religious and she is a character. She tells stories rather than lectures. She makes fun of herself, not her adversaries. She laughs and cries and both are really important. She is a woman of deep faith and prayer who shares her doubts. A friend once said to me, there is nothing worse than a grim do-gooder. In, in her book, Sister Helen warns against arrogant do-gooders, but she has done a lot of good and she is never grim. Sister Helen and Pope Francis are kindred souls, although she wrote him a fairly direct letter at the end of the book about the role of women in our church. She reflected the... She reflected the joy of the gospel before Pope Francis wrote about it. She resisted the throwaway culture before Pope Francis talked about it. She builds bridges, not walls, reaching out to both offenders and victims, defending the dignity of both the innocent and the guilty. Sister Helen challenges not only the criminal justice system, but also racism in our nation and sexism in our church. We ask, where does her joy, her faith, her hope, her love come from? That is the story of River of Fire. I invite Sister Helen and Paul to the stage and I ask you to join me in thanking Paul for bringing Sister Helen back to Georgetown to share her powerful, moving, funny, and hopeful journey on the River of Fire. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, President DeJoya, for your remarks. Uh, thanks to all the co-sponsors who've joined us in bringing this event together. And thank you, John, uh, for those remarks. If somebody could publish those remarks, John. Uh, they're really something. And thank you, Sister Helen, for coming back to Georgetown to join I'm us for this conversation here. about River of Fire. Thank you. Early 80s, I was a student at Fordham. I had an English teacher who was a lay woman, collapsed Catholic, I guess you'd call her, and she wanted to enlighten us about how, how out of touch with our own religion we were, Catholic undergraduates. So she, she pointed to the crucifix around one student's neck and said, don't you understand what that is? You're basically saying, see, my God, he fried. You know, capital punishment right around your neck. And then she said, and I gotta tell you, I don't see many Catholics these days who are visiting the imprisoned. At that very moment, you were starting to visit the imprisoned and you've never stopped. And at that moment, it was anomalous for a, a Catholic woman religious to be in that role. Now it's, now it's practically what we expect a Catholic woman religious to be doing. Uh, you, you've, you've changed the job description. Uh, how? How did this happen? Huh. Well, that's what the book's about, I mean. <laughs> I mean, Tim Robbins, we were making the movie, kept saying, the nun is in over her head. And I was. Uh, I, did, I never dreamed that I'd be going to death row. And I just want to point out, it's not just nuns that have changed going to prison. It's the waking up of Christians, of people of faith, to go to prisons. It's, it's in the Gospels. 
I was in prison and he came to me. But the waking up, see, and that's what I try to talk about in River of Fire, that grace wakes us up. And for a long time, I resisted that whole dimension of social justice. We had these huge debates going on in the community about what was our role as nuns, what should we do in the world. And we had like two little camps. I was in a little spiritual camp, and then you had the social justice revolutionary nuns in the other camp. And from the life I'd known, the way I prayed was basically to ask God to comfort those who were suffering in the world, problems too big for anybody to do anything about, right? Um, and then the other thing was that I thought the Christian life basically was be charitable and nice to those around you, but I never saw the opening to social justice. And I resisted it. And that is a sure sign the Holy Spirit is stirring that pot, because if you're not peaceful in it, and I was argumentative and I was defensive, and then I went to a conference, and Maria Augusta Neal, this great religious sister, um, a sister of uh, Notre Dame de Namur, who had taught at Emmanuel College in Boston for 40 years. What did she teach? Sociology in the New Testament. So boy, she was bringing it together. And she said one line in that conference, and grace opened, and it changed the spiritual trajectory of my life. And she said, Jesus preached good news to the poor, and I thought I knew what was coming next about how in heaven the poor will have the highest place close to God at the heavenly banquet. And she said, integral to good news to people who are poor, it's not God's will for them to be poor, and they have a right to struggle for what is rightfully theirs. And I sat there like you sitting there now, and I remember thinking, I don't even know any poor people. I live in New Orleans. We had 10 major housing projects, African Americans. So I left from that conference, and I had been changed inside, and immediately then began to go to the St. Thomas housing projects, and African American people became my teachers. And why I'm really glad to have Cheryl Lynn Branch, you know, one of the descendants from the Georgetown uh, slaves, who can be part of this conversation. Because us white folks, we got a lot of catching up to do. I mean, a lot of catching up to understand how deep the legacy is. You know. If it weren't you saying it, I would hardly believe that you, that you were so unaware or un, unmoved by the connection between the suffering of people in the United States and what you knew of the gospel. Because you say it with such authority in the book, I believe it. In a similar way, seeing your work, it's hard to believe that, uh, that, that your religious life was changed so dramatically by the Second Vatican Council as you say that it was. Uh, but, it, but it was, was it not? Yes, indeed. I mean, has it changed so many of us? Uh, it's almost like in a double cocoon. And one was my spirituality, where I thought what you did was you prayed for people. But I didn't know about the direct connection, that prayer. Some things, of course, you pray, it's out of our hands. When a person dies, we turn it over. It's, it's a big mystery. We can't do anything about that. I mean, like when a person dies naturally, they have cancer or something like that. Uh, so my main thing was I prayed for things. But there's the same from Latin America. What the eye does not see, the heart cannot feel. So with Vatican II, where Pope John Paul said, open the windows out to the world. The world's not a bad place. This is where God moves. This is where the people are. This is where the people are suffering. And where we have Pope Francis now saying, church should be a field hospital. Field hospital out there with it. Well, I had to awaken to that. And the second cocoon that I had to break out of was white privilege and just privilege, period, of growing up in a family where my father was a lawyer and I went to excellent schools. I joined the sisterhood, which assured my education would continue and belonging always to a community who supported me. And I was cushioned and I was resourced and I was protected. And when I got to St. Thomas and I saw what people were up against, I went, I'm not virtuous. I'm just protected and cushioned. And it woke me up 
And so then I began to learn. I was ready for the lives of the saints. Then I read Martin Luther King. I read Dorothy Day then and sat at the feet of the people and learned from them, which continues to this day. Because I'd grown up in the 40s and 50s in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now, y'all get this. Catholic, black Catholics had to sit over way over to the right in Sacred Heart Church. Black kids couldn't receive their Holy Communion with us, the white kids. Ellen and Jesse worked for Mom and Daddy. I didn't even know their last names. And we had a servant's quarters behind the big house. Jesse worked in the yard. Ellen worked in the house. And Daddy and Mama were kind. And Daddy even helped Ellen and Jesse buy property, get a house, help Jesse get a good job at the refinery. But they were kind, but never questioned what Jim Crow meant, that you had to sit at the back of the bus, that a father traveling with his family couldn't stop to go to the bathroom or couldn't stop at a restaurant. And this is what gave me compassion, first for myself to understand that when we're ready, God wakes us up and we help wake each other up. It's not that my mom and daddy were bad. It's not that I'm bad. And what I've learned about the death penalty, it's not that the American people really want to see people executed, but we're ignorant, we're removed, we don't see it. And so when somebody can bring it to us out of compassion, then we can wake up. And that's what's happened with the death penalty and that's what's happened around this whole thing. I mean, we look at all that is springing up when, when the way Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, can you see it? I mean, when you look at the news, you can just be so cynical, like, oh my God, we're going to the dogs. Nobody's telling the truth anymore. And look at, the, look at the hope that springs up. Look at the people going down to the border, telling the stories of what's really going on there. To get past that rhetoric of these people are rapists and drug dealers and gang members, they're coming to hurt us. People go and then people witness. And that's what happened to me. I'm in the service of this story of this event that happened. And in the preface, in the preface of River of Fire, here's the fire part of the book. And it was the witnessing of the taking of the life of Pat Sonia. He was the first man on death row I was ever with. And, I, and the preface, is, I say this. They killed a man with fire one night. They strapped him in a wooden chair and pumped electricity through his body until he was dead. His killing was a legal act. No religious leaders protested the killing that night. But I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. And what I saw set my soul on fire, a fire that burns in me still. And now here's an account of how I came to be in the killing chamber that night and the spiritual currents that drew me there. So that fire, this cross was made by an inmate at Angola, Eddie Sonier, the brother of Pat Sonier, who was executed, who was actually the one who had killed the teenage couple, his brother was executed. The whole system is so messed up. Neither of the brothers had good attorneys. That's another whole story. But when I visited Eddie, the very first time after Pat's execution, he handed me this cross. And the only way he could get money to pay for the cross, because it was only given two and a half cents an hour in the penal institutions, which continue slave labor or a form of it, was by selling his plasma. And it's the only cross I've ever had that was purchased with blood, and blood in many ways. And when you hear some of the theology of what people are saying, like a senator in Wyoming, when the death penalty was up for repeal, they needed her vote. And she said, well, if Jesus hadn't been executed by the Romans, we wouldn't be saved from our sins. There is such crass, ignorant theology. And we see religion being used by politicians like former A.G. Jeff Sessions who quoted Romans 13 to uh, justify the separation of children from their parents at the border with the same thing that Justice Scalia used to quote to justify the death penalty. And what is that section in Romans 13 that Paul talked about? Obey civil authority. 
It represents the authority of God. So you have Jeff Sessions saying to people that the reason we can separate these children from their parents is because their parents are breaking the law. Anything that breaks the law is against the authority of God. Anybody who studies the scriptures knows that Romans 13's context for that was that the Jewish sects were squabbling so much with, e with each other that the emperor had banned all Jews out of Rome and they just letting them back in. And so Paul's saying to the community, no squabbling, obey civil authority, we're all gonna be thrown out of Rome again. That's context, context is everything. But you have this proof texting where people can go and they can grab a quote to justify almost anything. I hate to see the way Christianity is being used by politicians to uphold torture, to uphold death, to, to uphold the separation of children from their parents. And how do, what's the counter to it? People who witness and people who speak out and say, wait, that's not the Jesus I know. That's not the God I know. And we give witness to it. And we have the experiences that give us the moral authority to speak out the truth by what we have seen and what we have heard and what, what our hearts now know so that we stand up. I cannot not do this. I can't walk away from it. I've accompanied six human beings to execution. And, and at the beginning of this, in 93 when the book came out, 80% of the American public thought it was a great idea. In the South, it was 90%. It's because they didn't have anybody to bring them close. The hearts of the American people are good. We do not want to torture and kill people. But when people are made to be afraid, as look at the immigration, look how we're made to be afraid of these people, not to mention murderers who are so evil and by the nature of what they have done. We can't put them in prison. They'll kill other inmates or guards. We have to execute these people as though you can absolutize evil in persons. It's the opposite of the gospel of Jesus where everybody's worth more than the worst thing they've ever done. And so when our eyes see and our heart feels we witness, it's what we do, and we have to be faithful to that. And uh, with God's grace, I hope to do that for as long as I'm breathing and talking. Uh, <laughs> so you don't have a lot of work to do, see? <laughs> amen to that. And double amen, because, and this is part of the power of the book, uh, you so credibly convey that you weren't always in this position, and not only were you not there, you made it well into midlife, uh, not um, making these connections that you now are saying other people need to make. There's a story in the book, uh, you met um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the airport, and you were not yet uh, on the path, is and that right? You've done a blooming thing for civil rights, not a thing. So this was the 70, middle 70s you were really turned around? Oh, uh, let's see, when was it? When, when Grace I'm only asking because it gives, gives me uh, hope context, that it could yeah. happen relatively So that was really in the late on. 60s that I met him in the airport. And yeah. later I found out when I read his life. And he looked so tired. He was standing in a line to get the airplane, get the ticket right behind me. And I looked back, I said, it looks like Dr. King. And it was. So I went up and I took his hand. I said, Dr. King, uh, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. I wasn't doing a blooming thing. I knew how to play the answer. My friend is blowing in the wind of my guitar. <laughs> but the wind hadn't hit me yet. But he looked so tired. And then when I read about Cicero and how he had gone, and then that white community, when they had marched, they spit on him and threw bricks at him, the, the white supremacy and feeling of hatred toward him. Then I realized why he looked so tired in that airport. And then I could roll up my sleeves and I could begin to join in the effort. But when you're not awake, you're not awake. And so, but when God wakes us up then, it doesn't matter, I think, when you wake up. It's what you do after you wake up that's really important. Because if we get an awareness and then we don't act, we can become more paralyzed. Well, I could do this, I could do that, I could do that. And I think hope happens when we put our hand on some rope, whether it's for abused children or immigrants, and we start pulling with a community of people, then hope flows through us. 
as long as we stand on the sidelines and saying, this is really bad, what's going on in this country, and we on the sidelines, we don't have our hand on a rope, the life can't course through us. So hope happens. I was amazed to find how freeing action is when you do something. It may be a little part of a big thing, but life then flows through you. I think hope flows through us then. And one of the things that's a dramatic moment in the book, action for you took the very specific form of moving to a housing project in New Orleans and taking an apartment with some other religious women. Uh, isn't that right? Absolutely. You, when was that and, and how did that happen? That happened, I woke up in 1980, Maria Augusta Neal, 19, by 1981, I had moved into the St. Thomas housing projects. Look, this is the 16th of a mile away geographically. I was out in the suburbs. But boy, the distance spiritually to move, cross that boundary was huge. It was grace. And then sat at the feet of the people, and boy, Sherilyn, you understand, it's just started hearing the stories of the people going with Geraldine with her little three-year-old sick in charity hospital going 11.30 at night and waiting till three in the morning till some medical student intern could see her sick child because she couldn't get health care. I mean, I'm, I'm just seeing people die because they don't have health care. I'm seeing people, the kids, going to the school, and I think of the excellent schools I went to. I learned how to do public speaking by the time I was a junior. Sisters St. Joseph, excellent teachers. Learned how to write so I could do a book. And here comes a kid, well, how far did you get before you dropped out? Well, I was a junior. Okay, well, look, we're going to work with you on the individual subjects like reading, math. He couldn't read a third grade book. Even if he had graduated, this is a black kid out there that can't read. And what's going to happen with him? And then that, it was experienced with him in particular. There were others, like Miss Ruby, 75. She just wanted to learn to read the Bible before she died. She was trying to figure out Moses. She wanted to know about that Moses that go up that mountain had to put a veil over his face. For her, the whole thing was, but that kid, and I, for the, there was an awareness that I said, you know what, it's not that I'm so virtuous. It's just that I've been so protected and cushioned and given an education. See, education is so important because we find out who we are and what our gifts are and that we can be an agent in the world and not just some little passive creature where everybody acts upon us but we can reach out, we can make a difference. So education's crucial, I think. And the way you tell it, you were educated there and you've been educated subsequently by African Americans who brought to your attention a broad systemic injustice of which, which has as its spear point yeah. uh, the death penalty and capital punishment. This is, would be a good moment to have Sherilyn Branch join yeah. the conversation. Come on, Sherilyn, come on uh, up here. Great. Thank you so much for joining. And now, now uh, let me listen to your conversation because uh, I have some learning to do. So tell them who you are. Tell them why you're here. <laughs> OK. Well, um, my spiritual awakening occurred uh, about three and a half years ago when I found out that my family descended from enslaved people um, from the Jesuits and was sold to Louisiana in 1838. It was a spiritual awakening. This is a Catholic university, and I am a heavy practicing Catholic. So I describe myself as a black female Catholic person um, who's rediscovering um, my roots and rediscovering actually who I am. So the patience that the people had with me, one more white lady waking up. I mean, you know that group, uh, um, what is it, uh, Undoing Racism? Yes. And teaching us about institutional racism. I know about institutional racism. I thought it was just prejudice. So, so we have to understand that Sister didn't just live for several years in a project in New Orleans. It was the worst. It was a place where people who were African American were fearful of going. There were shootings, killings, um, daily almost, and a lot of drugs, and really poor people. So it seems to me that 
if she could do that um, and learn, then maybe her learning would give her some ideas as to what um, people in New Orleans and in other places were experiencing. And um, her sharing that, and even, and I'll say thank you now for bringing me here, because I, I really um, feel that this conversation is one that we need to have, not just um, sister and I or sister and you, but you with other people. And I think it's very, very important for under, us to understand each other's stories, each other's lives, and to commune so that we can make change. Mm -hmm. Because if sister hadn't done that, even as a nun doing really good work, after all, she's educating students and giving up her life to do that. But if she hadn't taken this very, very bold step, a very honest step, then she wouldn't um, have the kind of influence that she has at this point. Yeah, we're talking too much about me because we <laughs> want to talk about you. Because the awareness, hey, wait, I'm one of those descendants. Yes, well, and, 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 and then, certainly. And your efforts, I mean, the agency. That, that people take in their lives, you know, and against so much. I mean, to just see people struggling against so many things, I saw real courage side by side yes, yes. with people just walking by and shooting each other. Or, or that drugs are a sub-economy when the mainstream economy is not working for you. Uh, respect for the law, that's when the law works for you. But when, I just saw the struggles. I saw it like a river where it looks smooth. You see the Mississippi River yes. in, in New Orleans? But underneath are all yes, those currents. Everything, and yes. you saw people going under. You know, it's their courage, your courage. Well, thank you. That, it certainly has been part of my work as an educator to have an influence there. But I had no idea that even my experiences with um, some of the poorest populations in New Orleans would bring me to this place. And I think because of my past work, um, it has propelled me to move in a very, very different way. Um, we can do a lot of things educationally as teachers or as um, folks who influence education, but to get your hands really um, dirty in the work of repairing what we say in our organization, repairing the breach, looking at ways that we can better understand the uh, false equivalencies that different races have. Um, uh, and especially in, in, in America where we feel that this is the land of the free and the home of the brave, and, and, but that doesn't cover everybody. So it is so important for us to, mm -hmm. to look at this very, very differently. And um, even Sister's invitation to me here um, at a time when she found out, because we've known each other for a minute, um, we, we attended belong to St. Gabe's. Yeah, yeah. St. Gabriel the Archangel. And uh, in my social justice ministry, um, working with and, and trying to influence what happens in the penal system. Um, I'd like to tell this story. Sister's a better storyteller. No, teller. no, uh-uh, don't you be saying that. <laughs> Go. Go. So working in so social justice, we were um, trying to um, look at how we could influence what was going on. Uh, there was a young man in our midst at our church We'll call him Jerome, and Jerome had been wrongfully convicted of a murder. He wasn't even present. He had attended a party. And so at this time, he was out of jail um, and was found to be innocent, but our district attorney was trying to put him back in. And it was, he had been in prison for 20 years, hard time, for a crime that he didn't even witness. And so we as a community, nuns, um, community people, church members, accompanied him. And he grew up in a suburb. He just didn't have this um, life to lead, but he never gave up hope. And what it said to me is that a person who looks like me, who grew up in a suburban area, who had a high school education and was in his uh, appropriate grade at the time from age 17, was put in prison with men doing hard time and trying to remain, uh, get out of that or just, just to remain free. And so as we accompanied him on that journey, we were strengthened by his resilience, by his wanting to be whole, and by his wanting to remain with his family. So what it said to me was that I've got some different work to do now. I'm, I'm retired or moving toward retirement, and I'm no longer teaching. I have some different work to do. Along the same time, I found out that I was uh, a descendant. And so 
it was approaching it from two different ways, one through my Catholic faith and the social teachings of my Catholic faith, but then also um, how do we make sure that what needs to occur with truth, racial healing, and reconciliation, how do we do that work? And so yeah. that's why I'm here. We could, you know, it just seems such a prime time to be talking about the legacy of slavery and race. Because you hear a lot of people saying, I'm colorblind. We passed the color thing. We had a black man elected president. We passed all that. I mean, I heard a, a, a member of the Supreme Court say, look, our family was Italian, and we had prejudices too when we came to this country, but we overcame that. Slavery was a long time ago, and I'm not responsible for that. And we don't know the connection that, I mean, that's what I'm becoming more and more aware of, yes. that by keeping some people down, who benefited from it? I mean, it felt so good for a change to go to St. Thomas and finally be of service, because here black people have been my servants of my family all the time growing up. I mean, and I was unconscious. It was like kind, but... So boy, then when you see leadership, like this lady here, and learning about institutional racism, even in the language like white, always pure and good. Cowboy right. movie, who's the guy with, with the, the black hat. hat on? That's right. Black ball, black, bad, white. Even in language, all the institutional racism. So to wake up and waking up together is a beautiful, good thing. It is. And I'm grateful for you. And thank you, and I'm grateful for you also. You want to get in here and say you're grateful for <laughs> I do, and I also am grateful for the opening that Ms. Branch already offered us to the audience. As you said, this is not a conversation that two people should be having or even three people should be having. It's a conversation we need to have as a community, and that's one of the reasons why these events take place. So I'd like to open the discussion, uh, the conversation to people in the audience, and the microphone's going to be uh, placed right in the center aisle there uh, for, for anyone who would have a question for Sister Helen or for Ms. Branch, or just a reflection uh, that, that they can respond to about um, the situation just now, uh, the death penalty, uh, racial injustice, our sense of history's changing, and so on. Is there a question? Uh, someone's going to the microphone right now. Hello, I'm Judy Code. I work with Pax Christi International on its Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. Yes. But um, I have two different questions. One, Sister Helen, I'm interested if you have any background on Pope Francis's decision about the um, catechism, um, if you have any insight. A little on, background? On, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> and then I'm also curious if you know about other schools similar to Georgetown that might make arrangements for descendants of enslaved persons, if that's in the pipeline at other schools um, or other institutions that might be making similar arrangements. Okay. Thank you. Let me just defer that right to Sherilyn. Do we know of any other universities or? Well, historically, um, most of the universities who have had, um, who are more than 200 or 150 years old, say, um, have had um, slave labor to build the universities. And so quite a few of them are coming together with a group called the S, is it a, a S, S? Studying Slavery, University Studying Slavery. So if you look that up, you can get the names of all of them because there are quite a few. Um, it's over, it seems like it's over 50. So quite a okay. few of them, yes. But in terms of a little background with Pope Francis, now listen to this, y'all. It took 1,600 years of dialogue for Pope Francis on August 2nd, 2018, to change that catechism. So when you love your faith, when you love your family, when you love your country, you stay in the dialogue. Because with the death penalty, look at it. And the crucial, some of the, the, the crucial conversations, like with Pope John Paul II, I was with this man, Joseph Adele in Virginia, he was innocent. And the Italians, God bless the Italians, the human rights of the parliament got involved with Joseph O'Dell's case and they were sending representatives of, I was his spiritual advisor. So I got a chance to write a letter to Pope John Paul. And when you're in the dialogue, it's first of all with the people. And when you talk to the Pope, you don't talk any different. 
You know, it's like Pope talk. That <laughs> it's just like the way we're talking now. And the crucial thing I wanted to share with him, I knew that the traditional teaching of the Catholic Church to support the, the right of the state to take life had been around defending society. It was never this thing of, ooh, there are some acts so heinous, heinous by their nature and murderous that we got to kill them and, and we're going to do it for the victim's family to get it. That was never it for the Catholic Church. It was to defend life. And so I said to the Pope in that letter, I said, when I'm walking with a man to execution and he's shackled hand and foot and he's surrounded by six guards and he kind of turns to me and says, Sister, please pray God holds up my legs as I make this walk. Where is the dignity in taking a human being, rendering him completely defenseless and killing him? It's that act of killing a person who's been rendered defenseless. When in our society we have a way to keep society safe without imitating the violence of killing someone. And I think it was that language, because even with prisoners of war, with the Geneva Convention, you can't take a prisoner, tie their hands behind their back and take them out and shoot them, because they're defenseless. It's the act of rendering a person completely defenseless and then killing them. So we have wardens like Ron McAndrews, mm -hmm. he's from Florida. He gives public talks and says, I'm gonna be in therapy the rest of my life. I took over being warden of the prison in Florida as an honorable profession, and then I'm in this room when they're gonna kill that person, and I'm the first trigger. And that person is strapped down, defenseless, and we kill them, and I participated in that. And so I believe that what, you know, moral hurt is one of the things that's beginning to contribute to why we're not doing executions. We haven't had one in Louisiana in 17 years. I think it's partly because the guards and the wardens don't want to participate right. in it anymore. Because, I mean, when you're up against it like that, here's that person and you've strapped them down and now you're going to participate in killing them. And I think that was one of the things. And Pope John Paul, please, I'm no Catherine of Siena with these popes. Don't any of y'all know the history? Know that St. Catherine of Siena. And I'm one little part of all the dialogue bubbling up in the church with the Holy Spirit of God moving us to help things change. And so how, how is it that so many people who lionize John Paul as John Paul the Great, many of them right here in Washington, are some of the strongest voices in favor of, of capital punishment? What, what twisting of the wires happens for that uh, You got any outcome? thoughts about those wires, Sherilyn? <laughs> that people can uphold the death penalty and they say they're pro-life? I, th I think people are really confused about where life begins and also where it ends, that there's um, something in the middle uh, that should be some dignity. And so for us, um, we'll, we'll talk about Louisiana, mm -hmm. that um, it's strange to me that we, we know about slavery, at least we know a little bit, but we live in a place that enslaves more people than anywhere else in the United States, but also imprisons more African Americans than anywhere else in the United States. And I think it, it, it's not rocket science to figure that there's a connection. And if, if, if nothing else that we learn in this is that there is something really wrong when we honor life at the beginning and we don't at the end. But you know, and what Pope John Paul did too was, you hear people saying, well, I'm pro-life. It's like they draw a bright line in the sand. I'm for innocent life. But if somebody crosses that line and they do a crime, well, then I'm all for their execution. And Pope John Paul, when he was in St. Louis, it was the first time he put the death penalty in with the other pro-life issues. He was the first to do it because he, he said no to the issues, the life issues that Catholics are used to hearing, you know, like no to abortion, no to physician-assisted suicide. And then he says, and no to the death penalty. And I was talking to a reporter who was there, and he said, boy, every time he said one of the issues, everybody was clapping. And then we said no to the death penalty, boy, there was silence in the group. I said, because they had never heard it before. And no, Pope John no. Paul then, and, and Pope Francis, of course, built on this, 
and it was, even those among us who have done a terrible crime have a dignity that must not be taken from them. And the heart of that dignity is no human being should be rendered absolutely defenseless and killed, not to mention after being held in a cage for 20 years or 15 years or 30 years and then taken out and killed. How do the people awaken? You bring the reality to them and through story and through giving people information and you can see people change because we're people with good hearts. Just bring it, we gotta bring people close. We gotta do that with immigrants. We have to do that on all the major issues. What the eye does not see, the heart does not feel. There's another question from the floor. Thank you for waiting. Hi, sister. Thank you for coming. I heard you when I was a a freshman at Georgetown here and about 15 years ago, and you really opened my eyes to all this. I was wondering if you have um, been involved or talked to Curtis Flowers in the case um, of the, he was accused of the quadruple murder, but it recently went to the Supreme Court after being tried six times for the same case. I was wondering if you have been involved in that at all, and if you, um, it gave you any hope what happened at Supreme Court, or if you felt it was more just a technicality of what, what when it was, his case was overturned, considering he's still in prison, despite being. Yeah. What his, Flowers' case brings out, this is in Mississippi, where the prosecutor keeps trying him, right. keeps trying, brings him back yes, this to get a death penalty again, is it is all up to prosecutors that they have discretion. And when we look across this country, I think it'll eventually be the constitutional issue. It was skewed from the beginning when the Supreme Court put the death penalty back in 1976, because they said it's only gonna be reserved for the worst of the worst, and nobody really knows what that means. You kill my mother, that's the worst of the worst. So they put an unbelievable fuzzy criteria and then left it up to the discretion of prosecutors. It's why we see with the federal resumption of executions, hey, we're gonna kill these five people by the end of December. Because you have a person in the White House and you have a person who's the Attorney General decide, hey, you have that discretionary power and it's arbitrary and capricious. And when you look at the state level, 2% of prosecutors and counties are responsible for over 50%. So equal justice under law doesn't mean beans. When you have this kind of practice going on, and then why is it that it's always poor people that you select to go for the death penalty? Because you know they're not gonna be able to get a good defense to marshal against you, and so you have innocent and guilty alike. We have 166 human beings who will come off a death row because they were wrongly put there. Sometimes by sheer luck, sheer providence, because the prosecutor didn't destroy the evidence. So Curtis Flowers, here's a black man with a prosecutor who's gonna go after him every chance he gets he wants to get the death penalty for this man. So it's before the Supreme Court, who knows what'll happen there. I know this, that is we have to wake up the people and it's when people change and the Supreme Court follows it. They especially follow the people on race. You look at all Supreme Court decisions on race, it is a terrible and tragic and sad track record of upholding Plessy v. Ferguson, upholding separate but equal schools, because most of the people are elites that are up on the Supreme Court, and they haven't, they don't, I mean, I'm being compassionate at this point to just say, they don't have a clue about the suffering or what goes on. And so they get in their little arguments over the Constitution this and the Constitution that. Like they cannot acknowledge that to take a conscious, imaginative human being and put them in a cell for 20 years and take them out and strap them down and kill them is a cruel act. They cannot see that yet. But as the people see it and consciousness grows, we change. And that is what gives me hope. And it's gonna happen with. So Curtis Flowers is one more example of this where if a prosecutor just cut a notch in his belt, we gonna get that guy, and he's gonna keep on trying to get him until somebody stops him. Hopefully it'll be a court. Hi, um, so keeping in mind that we can grab onto multiple ropes and care about many issues, this one particularly pertains to your letter um, to Pope Francis about women's role in the church. Um, how can we at Georgetown lead 
um, for change and grab on to that rope as well as the many others we've talked about tonight um, to help uh, hear, help the Catholic Church hear women's voices. Okay, we are the church. We've learned that from Vatican II. So every time women stand up, every time women participate as agents in the conversation, and what I said to the Pope in the letter was, we don't have a whole and healthy Catholic church if you have all males, the only ones sitting around the table making policy decisions. It's not good for all males to be doing all that, to, that we need women. No, it's just so basic. It's so basic. And people know it. And so this is how the Holy Spirit works. So the bubbles start coming up in the pot, and they start coming up all over the place. So then the question, why can't women be deacons? Why can't women, it, only males right now, according to canon law, can proclaim the gospel at mass. Women cannot preach. You can give a little homily, a little reflection at the end. Okay, sister, you give your little reflections. The real mass is done here. <laughs> Simply because we are women. It is so blatantly sexist. And it's got to change. Oh, it. No, and it will. Oh, it. it will change. Hello, sister. I just want to say your speech was lovely and inspiring. And it touches me personally because a couple of years back, I volunteered in the Virginia Capital Case Clearinghouse Clinic. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, it's all an experience. Oh, thank you. Some of the things I saw really, it, it made me see the death penalty in a different light and how little people know yeah. and how ignorant people are to exactly what goes on and how they, they don't understand that the people on death row have hearts, have emotions, have sensitivities. So what I wanted to ask you, sister, is that if there is one truth, one truth you could share with the world to educate them about the reality of the death sentence and why is it so horrible, what would you want to share? Um, every human being has dignity and everyone is worth more than the worst act of their life. You can never take a human person and absolutize them as you are that act, and so therefore we can kill you. We can never do that. We're too frail. We have too many faults of our own. We're too partially seeing. We're too biased. We're too prejudiced to be able to make that kind of decision. I mean, and then just looking at it from a faith perspective, who are we as human beings to say to any human being, God's finished with you. We're going to end your life. Who? It would take a lot of arrogance to do that. And because we're partially seeing that we have felt we can do that, but look at what's happening. Look out over the horizon. Can you see the wheat coming up? Can you see the new crop of justice arising? Can you see? Look at the number of people going to the border. Look at the number of young people becoming lawyers, becoming human rights lawyers, working to free people that shouldn't be incarcerated, juveniles sent to prison for life. Look, can you see the hope rising and can you be a part of that? We are changing it. But this big insight of the connection of slavery and the legacy of slavery and the penal system and how did we learn to do such cruel acts unthinkingly? like to whip a slave till they could bleed to death and not call that cruel? Was that not the seeds of now that you could put a person in a cage and strap them down and kill Amen. them? Amen. And it's not good for us. It's not good for us as human beings to think that we can do that. So it's all about waking up and we wake each other up. I believe in the goodness of people because I was just unawake. I wasn't a bad person, but I was really unawake on a lot of things. And we wake each other up, and that's why whenever we work for justice, it's always we're going to do it in community. Yes. Lone Rangers don't last too long in the whole <laughs> justice thing. You have a little flare, you yeah. go over the hill, you're gone. Thank Sister, you. Sister Helen, thank you so much. Sherilyn Branch, thank you so much. You're welcome. We now have an opportunity to take the conversation to a reception on the second floor. 
Sister Helen will be signing copies of River of Fire, which are available for purchase outside. Uh, she can sign one, one book per person because of the number of people who are here, and uh, the rest of us uh, can take our books and go to the second floor and continue the conversation. Thank you so much Thank to you. everyone. Thank you.